Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. I'll be speaking from Joshua. It's a tremendous book of the Bible. Chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. We were on a series called Crossing the Jordan. Last week was part 1 and this is part 2. This should conclude it. Joshua 3, and I'd like to start with verse 7. Now the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. And you shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you. And that he shall assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, the Gerizite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves twelve men from the twelve tribes of Israel, each one from, from each tribe, and it shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests, I'm in verse 13, and it shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. And the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. So it came about when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And when those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped In the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of the harvest, that the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap, a great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathan, and those which were flowing down towards the Sea of Arabath, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. Verse 17, last verse. And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. You may be seated under God's word. The Jordan River, during the harvest season, it flows very, very strong, and it's pretty deep, over your head, certainly. And it overflows all its banks in the harvest season. Now, that time of the year is now, March, April. It's the month of Nisan in the Hebrew Jewish calendar. And so as we talk about this this morning, it has meaning for us now. Crossing the Jordan. I'd like to go through 12 different parts, principles, precepts. We did six last week. We'll do six more in conclusion today. Number seven in this series is exalt you. It says there in verse 7, now the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you 
in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. The Lord's exaltation and the Lord's blessing and the Lord's pointing out his own comes to the true church of Jesus Christ, wherever they are worldwide, far beyond this room or far beyond my voice and those that are listening. God raises up and exalts his own. Now, I believe there is a great passing of the torch of God from generation to generation. He never has a time when he does not have a witness, where he does not have a voice, where he does not have those that will speak his word and touch the lives of people, drawing people to Christ. Now, it moved from Moses to Joshua. Now, those men could hardly be more different. Are you aware of this? Moses was the great lawgiver. He was the great author, the whole Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible were, of course, written by Moses. He came out of Pharaoh's court. He was educated. He was learned. He was a man of God in a true sense that he spoke with God face to face, starting with Sinai and going for the rest of his life as he would go to the tent of meeting and meet with God. Now, Joshua, very different man. Joshua was a warrior. He did write the book of Joshua, but he was a warrior. He was embattled in the sense of leading the troops. He's the one that organized Israel from a mob to an army. So he wasn't trying, this is important, he wasn't trying to be Moses Jr. He was looking to fulfill his own destiny in God. My son said to me this week, he says, greatness is fulfilling God's call on your life. Now the call for you and the call for me are different. The call for Moses and Joshua were different. You understand this? You do? Okay. But we are called by God into a certain spectacular destiny that it's his plan for your life to fulfill. And no one else can fulfill it except you for your life. Think about that. That God would exalt you is a great promise and premise. Now, this is not necessarily money. You're getting this, right? This is not necessarily fame, right? This is not necessarily some position or worldly power. Let's look at this Hebrew word exalt. In the King James, it's magnify. We read from the New American Standard today, but exalt, magnify. They're both a Hebrew word, galdal, spelled G-A-D-A-L, and it means to make large in mind, estate, or honor. Mind, estate, or honor. Say it with me. Mind, estate, or honor. Absolutely. To advance, to wax greater, to grow up, promote, tower. The church needs to grow up, yes? <laughs> that includes me. I need to grow up into God. I need to take the next step in the Lord. So do you. So do we all. The people of God are meant, I don't know if you can get this, but the people of God are meant to tower over all others. That's quite a concept for us. All the people of God are meant to tower, to wax, wax great in godliness. To advance in the kingdom of God. You don't want to stay in first grade or kindergarten or preschool in the kingdom of God. You want to go all the way, right? You want to advance in the kingdom of God. To be promoted into heavenly reward. You say, well, I want money now. I want cars now. I'm not saying we don't need money to eat. Of course, we don't. I'm not saying we don't drive vehicles. Of course we do. But it doesn't 
make the believer, the Christian, breathe. It doesn't make our hearts tick. What makes us move and what makes us great and what makes us wonderful in God's sight is to be promoted into the rewards of God and the place of God that He's called you and me. Stand still, number eight. Ho, ho, ho. Stand still. It says, in you, I'm reading verse eight. Again, Joshua three. And you, moreover, command the priest. He didn't say, give a suggestion to the priest. He said, command the priest who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Now, I already mentioned this happened at the harvest time, at the high water mark. This was the time when it's most difficult to cross the Jordan. Least obvious time. You're understanding this, right? When the enemies certainly are not expecting it, but even when Israel, it seemed to them to be impossible. Joshua and Israel needed the most faith right then. Now, Joshua and Caleb had, of course, seen the Red Sea parted, but the other two million hadn't. They hadn't seen it. (laughs) This was New Deal for them. All the priests that were called out by Joshua, New Deal. Oh, the whys of life. You know, life has a bunch of why, right? Some of you can really, I feel you nodding out there, absolutely. Why is this happening to me now? Right? The whys of life, right? right? This is the worst time for me to be going through this. Right? Why is this happening now? This is the worst time. Like there's a good time. But anyway, this is the worst time for this to be happening to me. How about this? As if I didn't have enough troubles. Right? As if I didn't have enough troubles going on. Why would this come down now? The Lord said, stand still. The great weight of God. Say it with me. The great weight of God. Oh, Moses. I already talked about the edge of the Red Sea. You know, the Pharaoh's armies coming down their throats, right? The Red Sea in front of them, and there, and there's the weight. <laughs> Elijah, after all the priests of Baal, right, had all done their death dances and all they're cutting themselves on the top of Mount Carmel. You probably remember that story. Then he prayed. I'm talking about Elijah. He prayed, and that moment of wait, <laughs> would the heavens be silent? Or, excuse me, would God answer? Hezekiah, when the Assyrian hordes were looking under Sennacherib to take them and cart them away, and right after he had placed that parchment in the house of God of the great assault of the Assyrian hordes as they told them they would give up, and they needed to give up without any recourse. And then there was the wait. What about the disciples? When they got 5,000 hungry men, not even counting all the kids and the wives and the ladies, and they bring the, right, the loaves and fishes, and then there's the wait. What about Mary? Sobbing at the tomb of Jesus. The weight. Joshua at the Jordan is told to stand still and wait. Number nine, one heap. I'm reading from verse 13. And it shall come to pass 
When the souls of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. And the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. This is a spectacular vindication of God. The Redeemer, I believe He is the great vindicating Lord of all. God's power. This was absolutely sovereign, divine, supernatural happening of God. Now, I've read all these commentaries about this stuff, and they got this could have happened or that could have happened. None of it works. Because if they were there at the high water time, and even as there was an earthquake like there was in 1912 or 1923, that stopped it up briefly. It didn't happen right then, and it didn't happen in harvest time, and the water didn't stand in a heap. Absolutely divine. The believer, that's you, right? The believer, right? Knows in her heart or in his heart, this was absolutely sovereign, right? <laughs> this wasn't some coincidence. This wasn't lady luck. This wasn't some accidental happening. God makes a heap. He stops sin cold. <laughs> Dry ground. Where do you place your feet? On the Word of God, right? On the Scripture, on the Bible, right? Dry ground. It's not quicksand, it's not mucky, it's not muddy, it's not sometimes it works. Dry ground. Turn sorrow into joy. Moves trouble to the dry ground of rest and peace. Turns the impossible to a spectacular display of His justice and righteousness. Now you say, why would it bother telling them the names of all these towns and cities and all these, these waterways? Because it was describing exactly where the heap was happening. It was 16 miles north is where it was going on. 16 miles away, the water was standing in the heap. This meant the priests were there stepping into the water and couldn't see that it was stopped up because it was 16 miles away. And so it looks like the water's still happening. Can you relate to some of this in your life? You know, it looks like the trouble is still going on. And here it's been already stopped up. It's already happened. You say, well, I've been praying about this deal for a a year now, <laughs> and, but God's already answered it. And the water is already stopped up and standing in a heap. Can I bring some biblical examples? <laughs> Mordecai with Haman and Haman's gallows. He built them high to kill Mordecai and hang him high. You know the story in Esther. Oh, and there the gallows loomed, and Haman, this wicked man, had no idea he'd built his own death rack. Thought he was building it for Mordecai, but in fact was building it for himself. I call to mind those wicked leaders. Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar sliding down the ramp into the lion's den that had held Daniel all night long. And not one claw, not one tooth came on Daniel. And they slid down, they and all of them, to their horrendous death in the jaws of the lion. One heap. I called to mind Belshazzar's Feast 
where he blasphemed God. And by the way, this nation can think they can do whatever they want and act however they want and say whatever they want. And they can feast on the things that were holy and ignore the things of God and reject biblical marriage and reject the image of God in biblical manhood and reject the life of the unborn and all can go on and on and on and they can do and party as they wish and then into the plaster the finger of God writes his words one heap Pharaoh's chariots, I can go on and on in the scripture. Pharaoh's chariots were chasing Moses and the Israelites and wound up in the bottom of the sea. This archaeological discovery just came out where they're finding all these chariots in the Red Sea, in the Sea of Reeds, it's actually in that area. And they found these chariots deep down, <laughs> covered up for thousands of years in the sea. Jericho's walls invincible. I can go on and on, shall I? Jericho's walls invincible. And I've been there with my wife, and now they're nothing but rubble and scattered across the sand. Goliath's forehead gleaming with arrogance and pride until the stone of David buried into his forehead and no longer was Goliath proudful, but collapsed into the dust before Israel and a young shepherd boy. A heap! Now, this wasn't the only time the Jordan split. Are you aware of this? Because the great prophets walked together. I'm talking Elijah and Elisha. And they walked to the edge of the Jordan. This was many years later after Joshua and they crossed a cross on dry ground. Elijah taken up by fire into heaven, alive, I might add. And Elisha came back down the same way where he'd walked with his master, came to the Jordan, took off the mantle of Elijah, struck the waters, and again they parted twice in the same day. One heap from their tents, it says. Verse 14, so it came about when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people. They were going from tents to houses. The people were going from tents to houses. They were going out of the wilderness, 40 years of tents, into the promised land, into Canaan, where they would build houses and stay. People always talk about going to Canaan. What a wonderful thing. And I heard a preacher one time say <laughs> these words, which I thought was kind of cool. He said, just because you're going into Canaan and going into the promised land doesn't mean you don't have to milk the cows and swat the bees because you think it's a land of milk and honey. You still have to milk the cows and swat the bees. Sure. But the people that day were moving onward. And these were the people that had come out of the fire of the desert You've been in and through a fire experience like very few others. And that fire experience is preparing you to come in to the land. Not the ones that had doubted and rebelled. Not the fearful. But only those of the spirit of Joshua and Caleb. Now, Canaan was filled with enemies. So their day wasn't done. Their life wasn't over. Canaan was filled with enemies. It was filled with temptations, right? 
big time temptations. It was filled with discouragement. It was filled with battles to be fought. Cain and we think, ah, it's going to be great. When you meet Jesus Christ, anybody here know the Lord? A couple of you do. Okay. Anybody here know the Lord? If you know Jesus Christ, I see a bunch of hands went up. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, when you got born again, you were born into troubles. It wasn't just a bed of roses. Now, your mama might have held you, but she was holding you to get you to the place where you could stand on your own and fight the battles. But there's a spiritual principle here. When you're born again, you're born to come in to the fullness of God, but it doesn't just happen. This is not a magic wand. Mortal to immortality, and I probably need to say this. This is part of it. The main part of it is Canaan is filled with troubles, and you come from the tents into the houses. But there is a sense of passing from mortal to immortality, We're moving from the tents. You understand this. I hope you do. From the tents of this fleshly body, we're moving to mansions of glory and from the wilderness of sin to the great house of God, from the earthly cities to the new Jerusalem, from death to life. We're going through the Jordan. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, this is worth reading because this is part of it. 1 Corinthians 15, and I like to read starting with verse 50. It's a long chapter, starting with verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, down to the end of the chapter. Hey, let's stand. It won't hurt you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, and now I say this, brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. He's talking to the church right through the millennia. We will not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. This is, of course, talking about the translation of the saints, the rapture, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come the saying that is written. (laughs) I've done this at so many home-going services. It says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. You may be seated from their tents. They went into Canaan in their houses. Number 11, they crossed opposite Jericho. Wouldn't you know it? (laughs) What an interesting concept. I'll read it for us. I'm just going down the dotted line. This is nothing new. It says in verse 16, it says that the waters which were flowing down from above stood up and rose up in one heap. There it is. A great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. And those who were flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off, so the people crossed opposite Jericho. The shadow. The people went into the land under the shadow of the walls of a great enemy. Were taken into salvation 
under the threat, if you will, of Jericho, the threat of backsliding, right? The threat of Satan's hatred. Let me just state something that should be obvious to you, the believer. Lucifer, meaning Satan, has been deceiving and laying traps for the people of God for thousands of years. You try to stand, you're listening to me, right? You try to stand against Satan by yourself, you're going to be in trouble. He's going to get you every time. He's been dealing with people like you for a long, long time. And he's so used to setting snares and traps and deceptions and sorrow and pain that if you're not pulled in to your Joshua, I'm talking about Jesus. By the way, the word Joshua means Savior. I don't know if you knew that in the Hebrew. Christ our Savior. Okay. But he's the expert, Satan is. He's the expert of evil. He's the demonic of the doom. He's the stink of the trash heap. He's the stalker of the night and the shadow lands of the gray. And the filthy waters of the lukewarm. Jericho looms at the very edge of the Jordan. However, we follow the victor of the ages. He's the great feller of giants. He's the great savior of Shadrach and Meshach in the furnace of fire. He's Daniel's God. He's the apostle Paul's God. He's Peter's God. And I pray he's yours. They crossed opposite Jericho. Now, Jericho had one of the largest springs of fresh water in all of Palestine. It was called the City of Palm Trees. It was right near the east-west roadway that connected the Transjordan and the hill country. It was always the most prominent city until Joshua. Sin, Satan, darkness seems to be firmly rooted in those waters, in that soil. Satan seems to have darkness well fed. You know, my wife and I were talking the other day and we were saying it seems like our life has been filled with so many battles, not with each other, but with life and so many Issues that we need to overcome, and we have in God. Not simple, but we have. But if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, do you want to? If you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, He's going to take you right past Jericho. They had to cross first. Now listen to me. Get across the water, the Jordan first, then deal with Jericho, right? Don't try to go after Jericho when you're in the middle of the Jordan. You got enough deal right now. Don't you have enough right now? Mm-hmm. We do. It says in Matthew 6.34, it says, So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Right, 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 right. Enough trouble of its own. Say it with me. Enough trouble of its own. Obey him related to the Jordan, then he'll tell you what to do about Jericho. Right? One step at a time, one river at a time, one walled city at a time. Number 12, and we'll close with this one. Until all the nation, singular. It says in verse 17, And the priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground. 
in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Now think about it, just for a moment. Here you have these four priests, right? They're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. It wasn't light, extremely heavy. And they're standing in the middle of the Jordan on dry ground because of the heap, 16 miles north, right? Had cut off not just the Jordan, but all the tributaries. There are a number of tributary rivers. As a matter of fact, the place where they crossed was where the water was strongest. Are you aware of that? Right before it went down into the Dead Sea, it was where all the tributaries came, where the water was strongest, where the harvest was happening. In other words, the most impossible. They're standing there on dry ground, and they're waiting while two million people walk in front of them. That takes more than 10 minutes, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Our mission is to stand firm until all the lost come to Christ. Our mission is to be on dry ground until we've made disciples of all the nations. The Word of God being the dry ground we stand on. My grandfather pastored in Jerusalem, 1920s and 1930s, and he held an Arabic service there in Jerusalem every night. And he learned to speak fluent Arabic. This was a Jewish man who had come to Christ, and he learned to speak fluent Arabic, and so he took his Arabic Bible and from the back to the front, you know how it goes, and he taught them God's Word. Then twice a week, he would hold a service for the Jewish folks, and he would do the same thing in Hebrew, because he also spoke Hebrew fluently. He would take his Hebrew Bible and teach. And he was teaching from dry ground, firm soil, Jerusalem in those days was a death trap. All the fighting factions were still going on, but back then it was, if it possible, worse. Bombs going off six yards from my grandparents' bedroom at the British consulate, which was bombed six yards from their bedroom. You talk about leading people to Christ. I hold in my hand my father's New Testament. And he wrote this in 1983. He wrote it in March of 1983. It was right after he had started the Indian broadcast over Transwell Radio. And it says these words. India, March 1983, they are no longer unreached. Thank the Lord, Psalm 100. 50,000 house churches started from one broadcast, and he wrote about it here. God means for us to be after the gospel until all the nation is complete. Let me conclude by saying, hold the ark. Hold it dear to your heart, the presence of God, if you will. Stand firm without doubt, without misgiving. On dry ground, the word of God, the Jordan River is in front of us. And maybe we'll finally cross that river in death. Or maybe we'll be translated at the rapture. We'll see. But certainly the call on you is to step into the waters and stand firm on dry ground until all the nation has passed before us. We are his priests. We are his ministers. We are his messengers. God bless you.